Hello there and welcome to the show. The Phil Hayes Show is brought to you by The Athletic and The Square Ball. You can get in touch with us on Twitter at The Phil Hayes Show. I'm Dan Moylan. With me from The Square Ball, Michael Normanton. Hello. And the main man, Phil Hay. Hello. What's going on this week on The Athletic, Phil? Big read on Dan James. Yes, him. Um, about how the deal was done with Manchester United and also a look back at the original deal that collapsed which we can all kind of laugh about now given that uh, the deal has actually gone through we've got some analysis of the draw at Burnley a, a, a look at what was going on out, out wide there and also um, a bit of analysis of, of Leeds pressing at the moment how good it is compared to last season and so on and also um, interesting next week piece coming up with a former Leeds player who has joined the Royal Marines Commandos and it's a perfect time to sign up to The Athletic and read all that stuff right now. Um, loads of stuff from the wider Premier League, uh, the world of sport as well. 33% off if you go to theathletic.com forward slash Leeds pod. 33% off the price of a full sub at theathletic.com forward slash Leeds pod. We'll get into Dan James and all that in just a second. Phil, um, first a mention about the walk that you did this week. Yes, um, it's the Jeff Stilling um, four marathons in four days for Prostate Cancer UK. I was on the leg from Harrogate to Leeds, although I must confess I played the recent surgery card and only walked from Headingley to Ellen Road. So there were a lot of people limping around. Um, I wasn't one of them, but really well attended um, and will raise a, a huge amount of money. Somebody said that that leg alone, the people on it had, um, had raised more than £100,000 between them. Um, so a, a really, really good cause. Um, it would be great if people uh, could support that and there will be a piece about it written in part by me on the site i think next week who said yorkshire people are tight it's not true especially when they're forking out um 25 million quid for for dan james so <laughs> let's get into that in this bit let's um just jump back a week if we could first of all when i threw you the worst kind of grenade right at the end of the show unprompted unscripted and said if leads are to sign somebody before the close of the transfer window who would it be you said I backed the wrong horse, didn't I? Yeah. Ryan Kent. Ryan Kent. There was a reason for that. And and the reason was that even on that Thursday morning when we recorded, it didn't seem like there was any prospect of Dan James being available. It looked like Ronaldo was off to Man City. Um, Dan James would be wanted at, um, at Old Trafford. And the summer as a whole actually is really good. Um, depicts pretty well the way in which, you know, the, it the transfer window in the market is a massive of moving parts. We spoke about Valencia's interest in Helda Costa months ago um, and and said at the time, you know, it's, it's going to depend on Leeds signing another winger. So if Leeds don't sign a winger, then Helda Costa won't go. Um, Leeds will only sign a winger if they can actually get somebody that Bielsa likes. Bielsa really likes Dan James, but Dan James isn't available. And then over the weekend, everything shifts. Ronaldo goes to Manchester United. Manchester United tell James that he's free to go. Leeds decide to, I say free to go. He is allowed to go if somebody <laughs> bids the right amount of money. Um, Leeds bid for him. And Valencia, right at the death, do the deal for, for Helder Costa. I think from Leeds' perspective, a very, very good trade, that one, um, irrespective of what you think of the price of Dan James. At Reed Dan James, to be fair to you, to give you a little bit of credit, you did keep his name always in the ring, I think, even... Um, though it didn't look like we were going to do anything in, in that regard. Why was that? Because this all relates to the way that Bielsa looks at players and the way that he thinks about transfers. So people will have seen No Lang linked all the way through the window. Um, and the reality with Lang is that Arthur thinks a lot of him and Arthur thinks he could be very good value. And, and, and he felt he, he tends to have a good eye for a player, particularly a, a prospect. And and he felt that that was worth investigating, worth setting up potentially for Bielsa to sign if Bielsa liked him. There were things about Lang's game that Bielsa wasn't totally sold on. He wasn't saying that Lang was in any way a poor player, but I think defensively and tracking back wasn't quite wasn't quite right. And you know that that, that matters to, to Bielsa. So if they were going to do a winger, and there was always that kind of whisper in the background, wasn't there, of we'll leave the door open to this. And, and you know, said all along, this will probably happen late in the day if it does. If we do actually go for a winger, it will be a, a kind of last minute deal. But because Bielsa fixates on specific players, so they've looked at Ryan Kent in mul multiple windows now, because you know how keen he was on Dan James back then and because it's quite apparent and nobody makes any secret of this, that he's been interested in Dan James ever since, you knew that if that became a possibility that he would want them to do it and then it would just become a simple case of do Leeds have the money beyond the question of whether Dan James would actually want to come back, which, which clearly he did. Uh, but as of last Thursday, 
I don't think even anybody over Manchester way saw Ronaldo going to Old Trafford. And had he not gone to Old Trafford, Dan James wouldn't have been available um, on on Monday or Tuesday. It wouldn't it wouldn't have happened. I don't honestly think they would have done Ryan Kent because I don't think they liked the valuation of Ryan Kent um, up at Rangers. But in the end, when it came to it, they felt that twenty five million was about right for James. Is Dan James the most linked player? we've had during your time covering Leeds it feels like he's the link has never gone away even immediately after signing for Man United we were, we were link, being linked with him again I think he's the most linked player that realistically you thought they were ever going to sign I mean do you remember how much Alan Smith was linked during the Grayson era I mean it was like every window every summer it, it always this kind of possibility and if you speak to Grayson or to Smith or to to people who are around the club it's never really going to happen and it wasn't that nobody was interested in it it was just that it was never kind of at the front of the queue whereas with this one you knew that if it came around and it was possible they 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 were thinking about it in the the last summer window before they signed Rafinha you know the idea that if suddenly James was available on loan from Old Trafford they might take him um but Rafinha came up and and they did that deal instead so yeah he, he's been linked for for a long long time it's it's one of those you know, story, players that Leeds are, are interested in or, or have a go at tend to get stuck in the you know in the media narrative constantly and and forever in a day because they've been linked before it's it's easy to link again but with this one he he was somebody that Bielsa was mad keen on um and because of that it was always it was always going to be left as a potential option if the time came. On a human level, I actually feel quite sorry for Dan James. You know, we don't often humanise our footballers, do we? We like to hurl abuse at them uh, from the stands and tell them to do things better. But, I mean, you've got a, he's basically a 23-year-old kid there who's had a really hard time for two years over there, being barracked by their awful fans. And then he's lost his dad at the very start of all this. And then you look at the end of his time over at Old Trafford and, what, hours before he signed for Leeds, he was being told that he's in their plans. And then they said, actually, well, no, you're not at all. We, we, we said that the other day. We didn't mean that. What we meant is this, that you're now way down the pecking order, so you might as well just toddle off. I don't think Solskjaer was desperate to lose him at all. James, from what we understand, James had been told about two or three weeks ago that he was definitely in the plans, and he started against Leeds, as, as you'll remember, on, on the first day of the season. And had it not been for the Ronaldo deal, uh, I don't think this would, would have happened. Um, Solskjaer would probably have kept him, but I get the sense that Solskjaer would stop Pyle players en masse over there to, to the nth degree. I think the board at, at Old Trafford, and it was a director who told James after the Wolves game that he that he needed to go, or at least that he was miles down the pecking order. I think they realised that they needed to recoup some money. They'd signed Sancho and they'd done Ronaldo and they'd done Varane as well from from Real Madrid. The, the, there needed to be cash coming back in. And actually, I totally understand that from a financial perspective. I don't think there was any argument for keeping James across there at all. But it has been difficult. The, the initial move to Leeds was obviously a, a massive debacle. And, and, you know, 90% at least Swansea's fault. It was a, it was a real ambush, that one. Um, he did lose his father quite soon after that and shortly before he, he signed for Manchester United. And I don't feel he's been especially well managed over there. Um, you could say that about this weekend alone, you know, being told before the Wolves game that yes, you are in the plans, being told afterwards you might as well go because you're, you're kind of seventh, eighth choice, something like that. But I also felt that he was a young guy who'd gone to a club where there was intense frustration about the Glazers, um, some frustration too about Solskjaer as a coach the way he was used and and the way he was played and and it's kind of struggle to to have consistent form there i thought made him a bit of a target and a bit of a lightning rod for that frustration because he was almost taken as an emblem of of the, the kind of underachievement that they were suffering from over there and it wasn't his fault i mean he was very young he was he was new to the club he, he needed a lot of coaching he he needed he didn't need to be brought on in the way that Bielsa will will try to bring him on now um, and i, I I hope for his sake it's a better environment here. I hope for Leeds' sake it's a better environment as well. But he always felt to me like a player who, for as long as he was at Manchester United, was never quite going to do it. Does he strike you as somebody who needs an arm around him? And the question that follows from that is, is he going to get it at Leeds because Bielsa is famously standoffish from his players? I always think with Bielsa, though, even though he is, and even though... You know, the, the, it's the, the famous story of new signings coming in and, and barely a word being said to them, you know, which is kind of how it goes from time to time. And Augustine Landon, and the first thing he has to do is to do laps of the running track on his own when he might think he'll be pitched straight into first team training. I mean, James will have his eyes open because Alter always makes sure that people know exactly what it's going to be like. And, and there's no point in sugarcoating your transfers here because players need to have their, their eyes open. Um, 
I think he will have an arm put round him in a sort of metaphorical sense in that he will be part of the plans. Um, he'll be coached. He'll know exactly what he's doing. He will get games. Um, I With Bielsa, it seems like his man management comes from the impact that he makes on players as players. You know, I think they appreciate him and respect him and deep down like him because he does improve them all. Um, and I don't think it will be any different for James. If, if Bielsa does that, he'll, he'll be grateful to him. Um, and I think... I mean, I was going to say there, I, I think this is a slightly safer environment. There won't be quite the intense focus on him, but actually that's slightly naive. I mean, having, you know, having come so close to joining in the first place and having been the sort of transfer saga that everybody talks about when they think of, you know, deadline day dramas, um, he's got to play well, hasn't he? Now that they've signed him for 25 million, people will be expecting this one to, to go well, but I think that it will. I feel like the pressure on him is... He's so high now compared to the, when he he could have joined the first time when we were at the top of the league for not all that much money, not huge expectations, not having played for Man United. I think all of those things fed back in mean all of a sudden he is he is kind of expected to to do things instantly, which is I don't know. It's difficult, I think, because I'm not even sure where he plays to begin with. He probably starts on the bench, doesn't he? Behind Rafinha and um, behind Jack Harrison, I, I, they seem pretty well established. But we'll wait to see whether or not there's any effort made to to convert somebody like Rafinha into a 10. From what I can gather, that is on Bielsa's mind. And, but I think it would take a heck of a lot of coaching. Uh, and I think it would it would be a, a longer term process. Rafinha doesn't instantly look to me like a Bielsa centre. I don't mean centre mid, but a, a Bielsa player in that two behind Patrick Bamford. It always feels like a little bit closer to an eight than it is to an out and out number ten who who plays solely as a ten. But perhaps it can be done. And I mean, Rafinha's range of skills are are exceptional. And, and there's that thought of you know a bit of rotation between Harrison, Rafinha, Dan James with Bamford up up front. It, it's potentially quite quite electric. But I think it's probably fair to say that um, he'll be on the bench against Liverpool. Going back to the man management aspect of it, do you think it's fair to assume that a certain amount of man management within Bielsa's environment comes from the fact that everyone's there on an equal footing? If you're in the 18, you're part of it. And then there's the senior characters in the squad as well, like Liam Cooper, Stuart Dallas, Luke Ayling, who are sort of the leaders of that group. Well, the good thing for James is that there'll be a lot of players left here who were were here at the time when he, he almost signed back in that first season. There still is that core who, who were here in Bielsa's first year. You also have Alta, who behind the scenes is very, very good at looking after these players and, and making sure that they, they do settle. And he almost does the touchy-feely man management that you don't get from Bielsa. He doesn't interfere at all on, on the playing side because nobody does with Bielsa. But he, he is there as a as a bit of a kind of sole support network if if he's needed. So this should be a this should be a relatively happy environment for James. And and Michael's right that there is a lot of pressure on him. But you'd like to think that he'll be feeling a bit of freedom at having come out of Old Trafford and come here. It is a fresh start. I I, I constantly looked at him and felt like he probably did need to be playing somewhere else. It just didn't feel like it was ever ever quite right over there. And I I, I don't think that was his fault. Fair to say as well, his reputation's been damaged, questioned, clouded, whatever you you might want to uh, phrase it as when he's been over there. So what do you think we're actually getting? What are we signing? When I look at him, I, I think the, the work is needed on end product. I think everybody would agree with that. He is ridiculously quick. I mean, exceptionally quick. And that is a that's a great thing for a Bielsa team. We'll, we'll talk about Burnley in, in section three, but there were, there were moments in the first half... Um, much as it wasn't a good performance, where the counter-attacking came through again. And, and that's always been a bit of a secret weapon in, in Bielsa's team. You have this idea of them dominating possession because they do dominate possession and that's the, you know, everything's based on that. That's the, the priority for the way they play. But in the season when they were promoted, some of the best goals they scored were on, on the counter. It was, it was exceptional and it was almost catching teams out because you want, they weren't really looking for that. They were looking for Leeds to be on the front foot. He feeds into that... Um, very much with, with his pace. But I think when it comes to picking the right ball, doing the right things at, at the decisive moment, that's where the improvement needs to come. And do you think it's £25 million well spent or will time tell in that regard? And what do you think of the fee? It's a lot of money, but it's very much in line with what you tend to find yourself paying if you're buying domestic players of, of his sort of ilk. I know that, that when, when Leeds, were, Leeds feel that it compares well to, for example... Will it go into Newcastle? Um, even Buendia going to Aston Villa. I'm not 
suggesting that they don't think Buendia is a very good player, um, and but he did cost more money, and they kind of feel that that it is, it is in line. It's kind of galling when you think that had they gone up in the season when he was going to sign, they'd have got him for somewhere in the region of seven or eight. You know, it is considerably more than that. But also, it was late in the window, and at at the, at the death, if you want a player, your selling club can really name the price. It wasn't a case of it was all on Manchester United's terms because they wanted the money too. Um, and Leeds, in the end, had to bid three times very quickly to to get themselves up to the level that that you know Manchester United were willing to accept. Um, it's the sort of fee like Rodrigo that you're going to have to get a return off. You know, you can't ha- you can't sign somebody for twenty five million and then be bang average. I think like with Helder Costa, you can't really sign somebody for fifteen million and then contribute. I guess you know the the sort of mediocre or limited amount that that he did it's it's got to be better than that um so this is a time will tell one i think if it was a choice between 25 million on dan james or 20 million pounds on ryan kent which is what rangers wanted for ryan kent i'd have been going for dan james i feel like for as much as we've said he didn't particularly do a great deal at man united it must i feel like it must have improved him versus the player we were going to sign from swansea just having been in that environment and played with you know, Paul Pogba and Bruno Fernandes and people who are undoubtedly uh, world-class players in there. It, he must have got better as much as as much as much Man United fans might have you believe otherwise sometimes. It, it'll also talk him about big games, um, Premier League environment. So it, the, the transition shouldn't be difficult. It's not as if he, he'll, you know, he'll be coming up against players that he's used to playing against. Um, the, the standard is not going to is not going to rock it. Um, I think if he settles well, he, he will be a very good signing. And I do think it... it, it Ultimately, it was the right decision to upgrade on Hilda Costa. I definitely feel that. And it is 25 million quid. We're paying for the first year of Ronaldo's wages, which is crazy. How do you feel about that, Michael, as a man who has his uh, fingers firmly on the purse strings? The money going to Ronaldo? Or yeah, yeah. The, um, both, both of them. We, we spoke about the fee earlier in the week. Well, but I feel like the money on Ronaldo's wages may well be at least partly wasted, so I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with um, Man United squandering that. Our, the fee overall, it does feel a lot, but then as... As Phil says, you look at you know Joe Willock and people like that who've gone this summer. Domestic-based players, they do have a big fee on them, and I think we're we're damaged by the fact that Rafinha was quite cheap, and we've still got players in the team like Stuart Dallas and Luke Ayling who we paid pennies for. So it kind of makes you think, well, why don't we just buy them again? And it's, but there's a development there, isn't there? And it, it, those players, you, they don't arrive ready to go, don't those players? So. It's maybe fine. <laughs> it's just, I, I, there's the spectre of Ridsdale hangs over, isn't there? But it, £25 million isn't a ridiculous fee for a, for a established Premier League team to be playing, which is what we are trying to be. I don't think anybody understands valuations anymore, and, and I'm, I'm the same as them. For example, Mbappe or Haaland, what, what on earth would you class as, a, as the right fee? Harry Kane, it, it's, it's all got so out of hand that you really can't say whether £25 million for Dan James is good money or not in the same way as like Willock to Newcastle, twenty five million. I mean, it's it 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 the market's just gone completely completely bonkers. As I say, if you said to me what is a fair offer from Real Madrid for Mbappe, I have absolutely no idea. I don't know. I just know that if somebody had offered me one hundred eighty million quid for a footballer, I'd sell him. I don't care who he is. Yeah, but apparently PSG looked at that and said, no, it's not worth it. I suppose when money's money's no object to them, is it? So they can they can just say, well. 180 million, we've, we've got loads more money. We yeah. We've got more back here, we don't true, need it. True enough, true enough, yeah. That's the thing, isn't it? The, the very top end of the market has been so distorted by the petrol and gas dollars that it's made nonsense of the rest of it. And I guess, but then the rest of it is like, so as Premier League revenues rise, transfer fees rise, and it, it always ends up in the pockets of uh, clubs, players and agents, doesn't it? As, as an individual club, you basically have to make sure that you just concentrate on what you can afford and what you what you need. Um, and if you can afford Dan James and you need Dan James, then if it's £25 million, then you do it. If that's too much money for you, then you don't. I think if you if you try to actually work out what players are genuinely valued, it's extremely difficult. And you can see that in the opposite direction as well, because in no way was Rafinha worth as little as £17 million. Do you think the squad's better then when it's a, a straight trade for Helda Costa? Have we improved the squad? I mean, we'll we'll do um, a broader sort of look at the transfer market in in part two, but just in this particular area, have we improved? Do you think? I think so, James for for Costa. Um, I think there are things that need to improve in James' game, as as I was saying. But it feels like a long, long time since Costa made any real impact, and and longer still since he made any concerted impact. I think what you can say for him is that he did play a lot in the promotion season, and he did feature in that and he did play a part 
but you wouldn't pick him out as one of the exceptional players from that year at all. And, you know, he was extremely expensive when he, he came in. He wasn't far off being a record signing himself and, and exceeding the fee that had been paid for, for Ferdinand 20 years ago. And it just hasn't really worked. I mean, it goes back to the discussion we were having about him seeming like he was best suited to a team who counter-attack. And, you know, as I say, Leeds are, Leeds are very, very good on the counter. It's just not the tactic. You know, it's just not the, the strategy to, to do that constantly. And it seemed a little more recently as if it had got into Costa's head. Um, I know that the, the kind of short-term experiment to play him through the middle, I don't think he was particularly comfortable with. But, you know, he had that game down at Crawley where he didn't shine at all. He, he played against Crewe and really you wouldn't have noticed too much that, that he was on the pitch. I think a little bit like James needing to go from Manchester United, I kind of felt like we were at the point where Costa needed to go from Leeds. He was going to become that substitute that was perennially frustrating because every time you saw on Twitter or saw on the board that it was Costa coming on, your expectation of impact was decreasing by the game. I think on the good side, he contributed a great deal to promotion. He was a member of that squad. Yeah. Um, But on the flip side of it, in those games where you would want more from him, like the League Cup games, you never really saw it, did you? And that's the thing about this squad is that the, the first 11 is strong and, okay, the, the form hasn't been brilliant at the start of this season, but when that team plays well, it is very, very good. What you're looking for is uh, and looking at most closely is what's behind it. And I think that has been, as much as anything, the, the reason for some of the frustration through the transfer window is not because people feel that the, the, the strongest lineup needs purged, it's because they're not necessarily convinced that the that the depth is there. And I certainly felt that looking at the bench um, at Burnley on, on Sunday. And as Leeds were kind of toiling and struggling in the second half, it didn't feel to me that the, the difference was going to be made by somebody coming off the bench. Um, it felt as if the difference was going to be somebody like Bamford or, as it turned out, somebody like Rafinha. Um, and I just think having, having James in the mix makes a difference. Um, and it's the reason why I would have liked to send him mid as well. I think you've captured the feeling there of Helder Costa warming up and even though crowds haven't been in stadiums, you get the feeling there's a bit of a uh, like him again kind of feeling to it. Whereas I, when James is going to be warming up, there's going to be a bit of excitement there. Whether or not that lasts beyond his first dozen games, it remains to be seen. But And for the defending team on the pitch as well, if they see Helder Costa coming on for Jack Harrison, probably not probably doesn't really give them anything else to worry about. Maybe a slightly worse first touch is what they've got to worry about, whereas Dan James, it does, it does maybe disrupt the opposition a little bit more. Well, if and when James comes off the bench against Liverpool, there's going to be that massive buzz, isn't there, of what is this guy going to do now? Let's let's have a look at this. He's already got a song that we sang at Old Trafford. Huh? <laughs> and that is, that's really funny because as I, I was sitting listening to that, I was thinking... Well, there goes the last minute move to Leeds, doesn't it? Like, you know, another another thing that kind of burns burns the paperwork. But um, as the saying goes, that's football, really. Um, but yeah, he comes off the bench, and there's that sudden interest about what is he going to do. I think that finish from Costa against Crew that sailed miles over the barn into the south stand, the the huge kind of sigh at the end of that was almost a way of saying, look, Valencia might be a good idea. Valencia's on the table. Valencia might be might be in the best interests of everybody. Do you think we needed that that little spark, that little something to refresh the squad, even if it's one player with a lot of pace to burn and not a lot of end product? We'll see, won't we? But um, do you think it was something that was important just to refresh the squad? I think it was important just to upgrade in an area where Leeds needed to be better um, in terms of depth. I think Harrison and Rafinha's first choices are are excellent on both sides, um, but it gives you it gives you more choice. Brian McDermott used to talk about this a lot, um, about the fact that people can make the assumption that a signing, no matter who it is, solves a hundred problems and that you can be frustrated because there's no signings. You sign somebody and suddenly you feel a little bit euphoric about it, but actually it turns out that they're, they're either not good enough or they're not what you need. And it doesn't make enough of a difference to satisfy people in the long term. And, And that's the point, you know, recruitment on its own, it clearly is gripping for people, but it's only effective if it works. And and James has to be a good signing. I I think after Burnley, it definitely made a difference to the public mood that suddenly they were in for him and suddenly that one was going to happen. I think people did want to see um, a little bit of movement. But I think as, as Bielsa has kind of proved over the years, it, transfers are not the answer to everything. McDermott, the man of course, who signed uh, Jimmy Kebe and Cameron Stewart for the wings, which, which well, wasn't a, it wasn't a great success, was it? I'm pretty sure it was around about that time 
where he was making those comments, where he was saying, I, I, in fact, it might have been before the Sheffield Wednesday game, where we were saying to him, look, on, on paper, those look like two pretty decent signings and they let you play 4-4-2, which you, you prefer with two out-and-out wingers. And then he weirdly played, I think, 4-3-3 at, at Hillsborough and, and the day was just horrific from, from start to finish. But I, it might well have been around that time that he said, look, the thing is, they're, they're, you know, the transfers... But they now have to be good players for us. I've seen them in training. Don't get <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Bad news, I'm afraid. Um, but it's fine getting excited about the fact that people have come in the door. It doesn't actually mean anything, and in fact, it almost makes things worse if you bring people in to kind of placate the public, and it turns out that they're they're no good. What you have to say about James is that Bielsa clearly loves him. I mean, is clearly absolutely fixated on him and, and has been for ages. So that in I think this is the the total opposite of the kind of um, you know impulsive last minute deal. This is a deal that has been on kind of on the cards for ages. Well, twenty four hours before we recorded this podcast, we put out a tweet from the show account at the Phil Hay Show. How do you rate the summer twenty twenty one transfer window for Leeds United? Just a little experiment to to take the temperature of the fan base. We got over seven thousand votes, so not everybody. We should say that. However, it's a pretty healthy sample, isn't it? just to see what, what people thought about it. And uh, the winner of the poll, four options, and that's the, the limitation with these things is you only ever get four options. Um, good came out on top with 51.3%. Okay with uh, 35.8%. Very good got 78 And poor got 51 So heavily leaning towards the good side of things, over half the vote um, with okay coming in just behind that. Which, is that a, a fair, accurate representation of, of how we did, do you think? I think it is. I think that's how I feel about it. I don't think it was an outstanding window, but but it was good. And I'd have been surprised if Poor had, had drawn much more of the vote. I think if Dan James hadn't have come in um, when he did, you'd have found a, a slightly different poll. But then that's the point, isn't it? They did sign him. And I do think they were basically a centre mid away from doing pretty much what they said they, they were going to do. And I've watched Conor Gallagher with Palace and he looks, he looks pretty good. Um, and... I can see how he would have fitted in and you put him in the squad and I, I can see how they would have looked as if they, they had moved forward, you know, not, not a huge distance this summer, but enough. And you would have seen just again that, that extra option that, that would have been useful. I, I'm loath to use the phrase net spend because people hate net spend, um, but they have actually spent a fair amount of cash again this summer. When you start adding up Furpo and Harrison, and I know Harrison doesn't feel like a new player, but you still have to spend the money. And then Dan James on top of that. And the, the investment that's gone in at the academy, which probably amounts to four or five million pounds, something like that. You're on about 50 million pounds again this summer on top of, you know, the kind of 100, pound, 100 million pound outlay last summer. And I, I think that's, I think it's reasonable for the club to say that that was as far as they wanted to go. They were going to try and do Gallagher on loan. And I'm sure there would have been a loan fee involved in that if they'd actually got to the point of signing him. But it wouldn't have been extortionate and it wouldn't have changed the, the overall spend significantly. Um, but on the argument of whether they have spent cash, and Bielsa said this himself a couple of weeks ago when he said he didn't think there'd be any further signings. You know, they they, they have genuinely invested in players. It, it just becomes an argument of whether you feel they've invested enough. Just to flip back to Helder Costa for a minute, what do we know about the finances of that deal? Because there is a loan fee there, and are they covering all of his wages, or are we still picking but up some of that? From what I've been told from people in Spain, there, there is a loan fee around about €2 million euros two million pounds something like that i don't think they're covering his entire wage but they'll be paying a lot of it um what the option is at the end of it i'm not entirely sure again i've seen reports in somewhere in the region of about 10 million pounds which i think would be, would be fairly fairly realistic the thing about um costa is that he's a, a mendez player and mendez is always very good at finding um clubs for players when when they need it um and you know even if you look at the 10 million pound fee potentially next summer and think it's a lot of money for a player who hasn't really done it at Leeds. You know, Mendes is good at weaving his magic with this stuff. So we'll see how, how that plays out. But in terms of cash that they've actually clawed back at the moment, um, they, they you know, him going to Valencia doesn't make a huge amount of difference. I think you have to acknowledge as well that if it, by doing new contracts for Melly and Bamford in particular, but also Dallas in there, the, the wage bill will have gone up um, again this summer and, and Dan James won't, won't be coming cheap. So in the grand scheme of you know, financial input. I, I do feel like Leeds have, have put a decent amount up this summer. 50 million, not to be sniffed at. I certainly don't have 50 million pounds. And when you look at, yeah, factor in last summer, 
150 million quid over the two summer windows we can obviously do the averages on that it's it's a lot of money isn't it it's it's more than a lot of clubs have spent in the last two years well the trouble is i don't think people think of 50 million pounds as a lot of money anymore and, and that's not anybody's fault it's going back to what i was saying about you know mbappe and Haaland and, and others the fact that mbappe can be in the eyes of PSG, underpriced at 180 million euros means that people no longer understand if 50 million pounds is a lot of a lot of money, and that's why it is important that that clubs on their own basis decide if they can actually afford it. That's how you keep your keep your budgets intact. That's how you avoid um, getting into trouble. But I think you know they needed. I felt they needed an upgrade on uh, on Alioski at left back without being disrespectful to Alioski because I do think in the main he, he coped pretty well with Bielsa's tactics. Um, and I did think that, you know, somebody to replace Costa was, was necessary as well. And given the players that Bielsa liked, it was going to have to be a James or a Kent because that was that was what he wanted. It's the centre mid missing that I think is is the slight problem. Um, granted, you do have uh, Forshaw in the background. Are you concerned that they've managed to, or not managed to, get that central midfielder now for, for two windows? Is that just down to Bielsa's pickiness? Well, the strange thing about Cuisance from Bayern Munich was that that would have happened had it not been for the medical. Um, that was as pretty much as good as done. Um, and it was only the concern about bone in his foot that made them think we, we don't we don't want to do this. Um, Gallagher, they would have taken, I think, disappointed not to get him because they're normally pretty competitive in, in deals like that. O'Brien made me think that there was a kind of sense behind the scenes that he was only worth doing if they got him at a certain price and if it was going to cost more and if they were going to be forced to go higher than they wanted to actually they didn't feel like they needed him that much um i mean with with o'brien you were talking about the difference of maybe i don't know three million four million to to get that one done that is not a huge amount of money for a premier league club these days and if leeds had been desperate for him I, i think you could have seen ways in which that one would have happened it just felt as if they looked to that and said do you know what he's not that essential um, and and actually makes you wonder whether they thought to themselves potentially next summer further down the line he might be somebody that you kind of feel that you don't really need anymore. I don't know. I li- I like O'Brien. I have to say, I haven't looked at him and watched him. I think he looks like quite a tenacious little player and and a lot a lot about him that's that's good. But yeah, it is undoubtedly the position that they've gone at and not been able to do for the last couple of windows. It's interesting, isn't it, that it took three bids to secure Dan James and you expect that that went up by several million quid. The fact that they were prepared to do that but not give Huddersfield the extra few million, it, it sends a it sends a message, doesn't it? I think the same happened with Ben White last year, didn't it? In the in the summer window, we there were a few offers went in in fairly quick succession until they reached a point where it, it was clear there was still a, a fairly large gap, which you have to say fair play to Brighton. They have since managed to sting Arsenal 50 million quid for him so which I don't think is necessarily bad value like Phil says I don't know what I don't know what constitutes a fair price for Ben White these days but yeah it does feel like with O'Brien I mean are they maybe going to look at him again in January because I think his contract is running down isn't it and maybe he's got he, he will be available again or is it or is it that it was now on ever for him well again it falls into the category of players who if Bielsa likes now he'll like in three or four months time and I find it hard to imagine that O'Brien wouldn't, wouldn't have fancied this move um i mean with james it start the bidding started at about 20 million pounds in the end it finished at 25 with with add-ons on top of that and it did rather answer the question of whether there was any money to spend at leeds or whether they could find the cash if if they needed it so when you look at the o'brien deal the, the potential for that deal you do realize that essentially they just thought his value was huddersfield's valuation of him was too high and they and they weren't going to go to it. you do wonder as well where O'Brien would fit further down the line, just to return to what you said there, Phil, because you get the sense that he was kind of a, not for the 23s, not quite for the first team, sort of on his own little level there, somewhere in between those two squads. And if you're going to go for a central midfielder, maybe next summer, and you could imagine that's where the major outlay might be in a year's time, it's not going to be a kid from Huddersfield, is it? You wouldn't imagine. The only problem is trying to sign somebody who sees themselves as a, if not guaranteed first choice, then regular first choice, because it's not easy to get into this team. And sometimes it's not easy to get into this team, even when the 11 who are in it are not particularly on form. Bielsa is very, very loyal to you guys like Cleek and Dallas and, and Phillips and so on, which does make it rather tricky if you're going to try and, you know, a, a, attack your, your sort of elite players. Elite players don't come to sit on the bench, they, they come to play. And I think with both Gallagher and O'Brien, there probably would have been that hope that they would have been 
happy enough to mix in in the squad and and to play as much as Bielsa allowed them to play. I think in the end, Gallagher realised very clearly that he was going to get far more game time down at Palace, and it it was certainly part of the part of the decision. You get it in your head because you know they've got Rodrigo and they've got Rafinha and the the you know they've spent this money on James and this Firpo who's come from Barcelona that they are going to upgrade little by little all over the pitch, and I I think that will have to happen as. As time goes on, so yes, if if there becomes a vacancy, say next summer, for example, they decide that they need to replace Click and they need somebody else in there, then yes, you could see them going for for somebody pretty expensive. I think if you're trying to sell the move to them while saying, "Look, I honestly can't vouch for how much you're going to play here," it becomes very difficult um, and and not straightforward at all. So it'll all be a case of of circumstance. But suffice to say, Gallagher was the one that Bielsa wanted and he would have taken O'Brien at the right price. Do we know how um, Rodrigo de Paul settled in Madrid? Is he is he happy there? Is he, is he going to be pushing for a move, do you think, in January? There's no point looking at me. I think you should ask Daniel about that. Uh, last time I was in his bushes, I all looked happy in, uh, uh, inside the apartment. That's so. depressing, isn't it? <laughs> uh, do you think that's what Bielsa was getting at uh, when he was saying about we couldn't really afford the sort of players that we need? So if you are going to get a midfielder you want somebody who's going to be an upgrade on what you've already got and those players cost too much well you remember the player the, the phrase you used that low prices are now high prices and i think you can probably apply that to o'brien from what i was told he was as clear as anybody else at leeds that they that they ought not to spend eight million plus on o'brien i think had it been down at four then yes he would he would have been happy for them to do that but he does take quite a keen interest in transfer fees at bielsa and i think he's always wary of Leeds spending an amount of money that that potentially gives a player a level of status that they haven't necessarily earned or don't necessarily deserve. When you when you manage in a dressing room, you do need to be careful that you don't have the. I was going to say the haves and the haves have nots, but that's a ridiculous phrase given how much money is is floating around in football. But the, you don't have horrendous disparity, um, and that more to the point, it doesn't cause resentment because you have players who are earning huge amount of money that at the same time are not contributing a great deal it, it is difficult and I think one of the reasons why it's been so good at Leeds under Bielsa is that there is a, a bit of a level playing field when it comes to that people are on different wages and once you get into the Premier League it, the, the the disparity becomes bigger and bigger and you have a, a much wider range but certainly down in the Championship I think everybody felt like they were they were on a par uh, and everybody felt like everybody in the dressing room was actually contributing I'm reminded of Steve Morrison earning twice as much as Sam Byron was being offered on his new deal for a time. And uh, yeah, it is quite hard to quite hard to fix those things. One of the slight mental disconnects around like the James transfer fee at 25 million is people pointing out like um, Coop Miners, the Dutch player who ended up going to Atalanta. He's one of those names that's been floating around for a while. He was what, 14 million euro, something like that. Really good value. Cunha, who was linked with his loads and he batted his eyelashes, eyelashes at us a little bit during the window. He was 25, 26 million. So was it just a case of Bielsa didn't want them? Was the money there? Um, Cunha was another one that um, Otto looked at and made contact with, but again, wasn't for Bielsa from from what I can gather. The difficulty with somebody like Coop Miners is you would need to hear explicitly from Bielsa whether he likes Coop Miners, whether he thinks... And, and it will never be a case of him saying he's not a good player. It's never about them not being good footballers. It's about them fitting that niche and that kind of narrow um narrow set of requirements that he has for footballers so that they fit perfectly into his tactics and i i've come to sort of understand that you can sit all day saying coop miners is a good player we should we should do him he's available for this we should do him but it's it's got to be on bielsa's terms um i don't know what he thinks of coop miners i honestly have no idea um but it wouldn't surprise me at all if you said to him he's really good value we should have signed him and he said to you in return, yeah, but he doesn't do X, X and X, so <laughs> therefore he's not for me. Do you ever get the impression that Victor Alter gets frustrated by this? Because he must, it, we actually appear to look at a very narrow range of targets, don't we? It's it's Dan James, Ryan Kent, Ryan Kent, Dan James. And I'm sure Victor Alter is going with countless other wingers. And do you think he will be frustrated by the fact that Bielsa isn't willing to maybe take a chance on someone like Noah Lang? No, because I think he knows that that's how it is. Um, so his job is really to serve up options, viable options and decent options, and then to see what Bielsa says. And and there will be, like with Lang, for example, there will be players that Otto looks at and thinks he could be a very good investment. We could actually make a lot of money from him further down the line, or he could go on to be a, a, a top player. Um, but he knows that Bielsa will only take a certain type, and that's how it's been set up to work. That's how it, it has to work. 
I think anybody who works in recruitment will always have that frustration of chasing after deals and working on deals that come to nothing. I mean, Otter will have wasted this summer phone calls galore on Conor Gallagher and on Lewis O'Brien. He, he will have spoken about Lang, he'll have spoken about Cunha. Um, but if you, when he shows you his scouting database, it's massive. I mean, there's so many players in it and so many reports that in order to actually sign all of those players, you would need to work for about 15 clubs. Uh, so the, I, I guess the reality of recruitment is most of the work you do is not going to lead to anything, but you do it because every now and again it throws up those little gems that you want to sign. One I wanted to pick your brains on, there were reports from Spain of an inquiry from Barcelona for Rodrigo. Any truth in that? Have you heard anything about that? My understanding is that Barcelona were keen on him and did have a look at him, um, but Barcelona have been such a mess um, through this window that it didn't feel like it ever got to a point where, where they were serious about it. Um, I mean, Leeds in no way would have let him go on loan. Um, it would it would have had to have been a permanent. And I don't think they want Rodrigo to go. I don't think Rodrigo wants to go. They also spoken a few times about trying to keep him in the keep him in the building, keep him in the mix, get him get him into form. Um, so I, it didn't seem to me like that was was ever going to happen. And I mean, I, I don't from the PR point of view, I really don't know how that would have looked on you know right at the end to have been doing a deal for him. Um, but there was Spanish interest in him without a doubt because he is a very good player. Would you have been tempted? On loan, absolutely not. Um, I still think even if you're getting offered money for him, I still feel like I want to see whether this one's going to work because I feel like if it does work and if he does click, he could be very, very good. Um, I think if in a year's time we're still talking about him in the same way, you're going to have to ask where this one's going and you know what the what the best plan of attack is with it. But it seems pretty clear to me that Bielsa is determined to try and to try and make this happen. Um, it's just hard to tell whether this number 10 role that he's in is, is going to be good for him long term and that goes back to the you know the wisdom of crowds kind of thing i was talking about with this uh, this poll about the transfer window just to get an overall feel of it there is a very big real overriding sense that it's not right for him there and i don't like him there it just hasn't worked and i, I i'm not sure it will does that come back to the fact that bielsa doesn't really rely on out and out number tens, you know. I mean, I don't think Rodrigo is an out and out ten anyway. I think he, he is a he is a nine, but that's not to say that he can't adapt and he can't change because that's kind of the that's the kind of hallmark of Bielsa as a coach. But it it feels to me like you need to have more of a defensive mind alongside your attacking game. You've there's got to be defensive output from you, which I don't feel is ever going to be Rodrigo's strength. There were a couple of really nice touches from him from at Burnley. There were a couple of little moments where. You know, he was clever, he was inventive, he helped to open things up. But there were also periods of the game where you felt that there was huge pressure on Phillips and not enough from, from the midfielders in front of him. And I always think back to, to Saez in, in that first season, how good he was in the first month, but then how quickly he fell out of favour. And when you think of some of the players that Bielsa has backed consistently, despite the, the impression on the outside that they're all, you know, from the stands and, and from us in the press that form isn't great you know he take Bamford when he's out of the goals you know the way Bielsa sticks with him and sticks with him with Saez it felt as if he was out of the team pretty quickly in comparison to all of that and I think that did sort of lend itself again to really the sense that if Bielsa had his way two hybrid eight stroke tens are ideally what he'd like there um, rather than somebody like like an, an, an out and out number 10 and, and that's what makes me wonder how it would go for Rafinha if, if he tried to play there what a for sure because uh well Andrea Ratrizzani um suggested I don't know whether it was tongue in cheek on Twitter that he might be <laughs> the new midfielder that we've uh, we've all been craving in this window uh that, is, is, is he up to that that really didn't seem very sensible at all I think the the right thing to have done there when somebody asked where's our midfielder would have been potentially to have said nothing given that it was in reply to Patrick Bamford's moment and the call up for England but I think to have said if you had to look there's nothing out there that works for us at the moment so we're not going to do it but you know we're optimistic about Forshaw and hopefully he'll be okay as opposed to you know dropping a bit more pressure on Forshaw I thought Forshaw looked really good against Crew physically I thought he, he got into the game he didn't look scared of sticking his foot in he didn't look uncomfortable moving at all um I actually feel like he could be an asset this season. I, I do think there's there's the possibility for that. And if he is, then perhaps the absence of another midfielder, you know, is 
is not a problem. I mean, I, I look at Foscher and I see straight away how he fits into this team and, and I see straight away what it is about him that Bielsa likes so much. He is a he is a Bielsa midfielder, without any doubt. Um, it's just that concern at the back of your mind until he's played three, four months and has, has shown that he's totally, totally over it. It's not at all fair to put pressure on him, I don't think. But, you know, potentially, potentially that is a big bonus. We've been here before with players as well in the past where people come back from long injuries and there is that sense of watching them play and just the fear. I remember it with, with Lucas when any, anyone used to put a tackle in on him and when Bridges came back, that moment where the, the crowd sort of falls silent and it's like... Oh, he's got up. Is, <laughs> is this it again? Is this it for another year? But then uh, if, I think for, uh, for sure, as you say, a fully fit for sure, you can see where he fits perfectly. You can see he can cover for, for both Calvin and Click in the midfield. He's He was part of a successful team at the start of our promotion campaign wasn't he and it's it's just it's just the fitness is such a complete unknown for him it's um it feels like we're we're putting a lot a lot on him i think to to expect him to do anything this season i think the bottom line is that if he doesn't have a recurrence of this hip and groin problem then it's all a question of match fitness and him avoiding the sort of standard niggles that players get or picking up anything completely different i thought of burnley there was a period in the game where he would have helped. I definitely did. I, I thought that was a that looked to me like a slightly more obvious substitution than some of the others that were made. And I hope that we'll see him get more and more of a chance. I hope we will see him come to play. I hope, come into play. I hope he will become a regular option off the bench and play well enough to potentially start as well. I just don't think it's fair to look at him and and say you're the answer to all of this because everybody knows what he's been through. So should we heap the pressure on Lewis Bate? <laughs> well, That's an alternative. I, mean, I, I have to say, when Bate came in, and, and he's a real, he is a real prospect. Chelsea did not want to lose him, but I had zero expectation of him playing for the first team this season. I'm not saying he might not get the odds a few minutes here and there, um, but I, I don't think they're going to be leaning on him too heavily. Let's talk Burnley now, then and reflect on that game at the weekend. The good thing about doing this show towards the back end of the following week is it gives everybody a chance to calm down and assess it. And you've normally got a, a more level-headed uh, view of, of the matches, Phil. So tell us about what you think about what happened at Burnley. Has Ashley Barnes calmed down yet? Ashley Barnes. That was a red card, really, wasn't it? I was discussing this on Twitter with somebody during the game. Um, somebody who was saying... Because everybody knows that there's been this change in refereeing directives um this idea that you let more things go the, the thing is i made the assumption stupidly perhaps that what they were getting at was that they were going to try and kind of dissuade people from feigning it and faking it um i didn't think it was going to be a green light for players to fire into each other in the way that they were at burnley i think that the tackle by me and actually if we're being fair as well the sliding foul by strike are definite yellow cards they're, they're yellow cards that are getting a little close to the edge but I had no problem with those the Barnes one to me it just looked like him taking out Dallas and actually I mean I was watching Dallas having a pop at him afterwards and I think that was fair enough da Dallas tends to take this stuff and just get on with it he does get clattered fairly, fairly regularly um, if, you, if you keep an eye on him but you know he was obviously unhappy about that and I was watching some of the coverage of it the following day and the general feeling did seem to be that ought to be a red card. And I, I think we're heading for a big fight over this because Klopp's already moaned about Burnley. Bielsa was never going to do that, although he described the game as very disputed, <laughs> which I think is a, a sort of um, Bielsaism, really, isn't it? I think um, I think there would have been some of those challenges that he would have looked at and thought, you know, that that's a bit over the top. Um, Barnes, I think, is in danger of becoming the Antichrist in the in the Premier League. Um, but that was, that was a bad one. And I don't think further forward... Um, you can have a season where those sort of challenges are going on indefinitely because somebody will get injured and there will eventually be a massive argument over this. Um, I think that was certainly an element of the game and it was extremely physical. I, I don't think you can let that deflect wholly from the fact that Leeds were pretty flat over there. It, it just It just doesn't feel as sparky to me as it does when, when they're at the best. It was much better against Everton. It was... It was more competitive. They 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 dominated parts of that, and they looked more more assured. Burnley, it it felt a bit more tentative. I was talking earlier about the there was a period of about five minutes in the second half where 
Leeds had three sort of identical counter-attacking situations. And uh, there was the Rafinha shot wide, there was a Harrison cross that found the Burnley player, and then there was the cross from Phillips that um, that Bamford toe-poked to, to Nick Pope, heavy touch. And in all three situations, it was just a, a tiny bit of precision away from opening the scoring. And actually, had they opened the scoring, it might have developed into the same game as last season where Cleek scored on the break just before half-time. Game went 1-0, Leeds turned the screw, took control and, and won at a canter. It could have been a different afternoon. But I did feel like there were long periods of that game where they didn't feel in control. And I have to say, I mean, you can thank me later for jinxing it at 1-0, but I didn't see that goal coming because they had not created anything, you know, for, for 20 minutes beforehand. Do you think the formation is uh, is to blame for this at all? Because we never look as effective in that 3-3-1-3 as we do in the, uh, in the 4-1-4-1. I always feel less confident about Leeds in that. And it's strange because it's a formation that Bielsa has been working with for, you know, right back to, to the year dot. Um, it's just that, that Leeds more often than not play 4 one 4 one because there aren't actually that many teams who go two up top. And I understand the logic of wanting an extra centre-back. It gives you that, that layer of insurance and protection at the back. But it does expose Phillips and it does put Phillips in a position where the opposition can actively try to outnumber him and overload him, which is exactly what Burnley... Burnley tried to do and I, when when Burnley um, opened the scoring I was having a look at the, the stats and Leeds had had about 61% of possession which is not unusual but there'd only been about 17% of the game which had been played in Burnley's final third most of it had been you know in the middle of the pitch or around Leeds box and I think it gave you a fair idea of how much they were struggling to get beyond Phillips and into that midfield zone that, that sort of pocket beyond halfway where they could could do damage and also what became apparent, and I've, I've written about this in a piece this morning alongside um, some stuff about the, the pressing, I mean, Burnley just started to double up on the wings. I mean, Harrison was, I, I thought Harrison's effort on the Sunday, was physical effort was absolutely terrific. But time after time, he was on the left wing with two players around him, three players around him. He had nine crosses, none of which came to anything. And, and most of that was down to the fact that there was just no space to work in. And likewise, they tried to do the same with Rafinha. It was just that with four minutes to go, Rafinha had that little bit of magic that tied Charlie Taylor in knots and, and suddenly opened everything up. That was funny, wasn't it? It was great. <laughs> he'd, he'd, almost, he'd almost done that um, a little while earlier, the same. And Taylor had, had fallen over again, but had just got a foot in and had just managed to ricochet the ball. And what you found was that as Rafinha went for it again, suddenly it was like two other players coming from, from nowhere to, to smother him because they knew that they had to. And they were trying to go two on one with him when he went past Taylor, but as soon as Taylor lost his foot and it was um, straight through the gap. Is this where someone like Dan James comes in when teams are uh, getting stretched late on and we're struggling to break down? Because we play from side to side, side to side, and a lot of our stuff goes down the wings, doesn't it? Um, Dan James offers something different in that regard. Maybe you can you can tuck um, Rafinha inside for a bit and then leave Dan James hugging the touchline, whatever it might be. Absolutely. I mean, that's the, the, the whole thing about Bielsa's football and his style of performance is that the, the wings are... Are crucial. So if you want to negate leads, you either have the basic strategy, and this is easier said than done, but the basic strategy of depriving them of the ball, provided that you can you can manage the counterattacks, or you try and clog them, clog up things out wide, because when you do that, it becomes very difficult for leads to create. They're not a side who tend to go through the middle in, in quite the same way. So yeah, I mean James in that area, they, they also, you know, they also some of his most expensive signings have been wide players you know even Harrison at, at 11 million but Dan James now at 25 million Rafinha um, at 17 Costa at 15 16 whatever it was in the end that's an area that he quite clearly spends a lot of time thinking about and, and a lot of time thinking about how he might recruit there um, if he needs to and likewise left backs it's you know it's all part of the same thing but if you're a left back in Bielsa's team or a right back your your job is incredibly complex, even in an era where attacking fullbacks are kind of the norm. You know, you've got to overlap, you've got to underlap, you've got to be able to pass out of tight spaces, you've got to have the stamina to go box to box, but you've also got to have the positional sense to defend a lot one-on-one. -on -one. It's really, really tough, which is why it's not always easy to find players who will fit in nicely. But yeah, J James should help in the area where Leeds are at. The, where, when Leeds are at the best, it's when they're strong out wide. Do you think we missed um, Furpo and Click on Sunday? Not especially. I think Click might have made a difference, um, but it felt to me like the formation was leaving Phillips too exposed in, in that area. And I'm not sure even with Click in the team, it would necessarily have made a, a massive difference because the 3-3-1-3 the does just mean 
that you you have that big wide open area where if the opposition do flood two or three into there, it, it becomes problematic. I suppose if you'd had Clake as you know the as the ten um, or the the one in behind Bamford, you get more in a defensive sense from him than you do from somebody like like Rodrigo. But it just didn't feel just didn't feel totally balanced to me. Do you feel like a few days down the line, that's probably a better point than we gave it credit for on Sunday? Important not to lose that game um, and to keep ticking over. I don't think many people will have come away thinking that's a great point in the way that you felt that after Everton, that was a really, really good point because they're very strong and they've got a lot of lot of good players, Everton. I think Burnley are the sort of team you want to be, you want to be beating. But I think a draw there creates a smoother week than a defeat without any doubt. Do you reckon, Michael, like the, the recruitment of James changes the narrative a bit around the Liverpool home game and it'll uh, draw the focus onto the new shiny thing instead of any anxiety about the result? It depends how the Liverpool game goes, doesn't it? If we're um, if we're a, a couple of goals down within 20 minutes, I think it, it very quickly yeah. changes onto where, where's the central midfielder again. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and Liverpool at home, let's be honest, it is a game we will probably lose. They're, a, they're an exceptional side, maybe not quite at the level they were at a year or two ago, but you know they, it will be an in- incredibly hard game to get anything from. I think you have to accept that the games against the top four this season will be will be very very tough and probably more difficult than last season as well. A lot of them have upgraded and and a lot of them have have started started really well. So I agree with Michael. It's a it's a hard game to to, to expect to take anything from. And and in that respect, Newcastle away becomes you know the, the much bigger game of the two. I think. The thing about this team is they they can play so much better than this, and and that's that's kind of the the encouraging aspect of it really is that you're waiting for it to properly click again. And we've all we've been spoiled in a way. We've been used to Bielsa just clicking his fingers. Well, I say clicking his fingers. I mean he would hate that expression because it's hardly like it just happens out of nowhere. But the start of the season, bang! I always remember going to Bristol City in his second season, and. Even though Leeds were playing in exactly the same way as they always did, they just looked so fresh, um, and it was it, it kind of looked very very vibrant as if he'd he managed to get them get them going again and, and get them at full tilt, um, despite the fact that everybody knew what what they were about. It's been a little bit different this season, and it hasn't quite been the sort of aggressive start that they had in the Premier League last year. But you do you always get dips in football. Um, I was talking about the pressing and the the, the pressing seems to be in line with the, the second half of last season. There's no doubt that it's dipped in the Premier League, but I think that's largely because of the standard of the opposition. And you couldn't say that the fact... that The pressing on the Bielsa was at its best and it's most aggressive in the second year in the Championship. You can hardly say that the dip that occurred in the Premier League in, in that area was a problem, given that they finished ninth and the, result, the results were so good. I think they're OK. I think they're OK. I just think that across the team, they could be playing better and they could definitely have more spark. We'll preview Liverpool uh, next week in the run-up to that when we've uh, we've heard from Bielsa. But it is, in that leads way, it's exactly the sort of game we'll, we'll go and win. Chances are we will lose, you're right. But there's nothing to say that we might not just do something silly and win. You're going to predict a win, aren't you? I can feel it. Well, let's not spoil the surprise for next week. We want people <laughs> to tune in next week, don't we, Phil? So don't ruin it. God. But it is, isn't it? Sometimes when, when Leeds need a result, and it's always felt this way under Bielsa, um, even when we've hit a bad run of form, we pull one out of the bag at some point it may well be Newcastle you know true to form and what you'd expect but you never know don't write it off against Liverpool that's all I'm saying no and and also you know before drawing outright conclusions give it six seven games see where where we are there are quite a few teams actually who have not started well and I know it's it kind of kind of makes sense that and 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 as much as if some teams do start well, some teams have to start badly but it does feel to me like there are quite a few who have not got much impetus um on the go right now so they're not alone in in that sense Leeds and you, you don't really feel that with it either I wouldn't have said that the division is taking much shape at the moment it's going to take a little while I know it was only the League Cup but do you think beating Crew um settled a few nerves and just gave them that little bit more belief and momentum it's it's the first win of the season it's important to get it isn't it yeah I, I don't get I don't see in the players a huge amount of nervousness or a huge loss of confidence. I think they would probably say themselves that they're not they're not at their peak at the moment. Um and you're not seeing the the highest level of Bielsa performance. But they always have that underlying belief that it will come. Um and the fitness levels are absolutely fine, um, I think. Um I don't see any any great issue in that respect. It just hasn't it just hasn't been a flying start at all, has it? Um 
And obviously, if the form sets in, and if you go for an extended run, then it's a problem, and that's when confidence starts to drop. But if they're looking around the league, I think they'll be seeing plenty of other teams who, who are not exactly tearing it up at the moment. And the recruitment of James does just freshen it up, give us something new to look at, and um, like I say, we can... We'll see how it goes against Liverpool, but we can focus on something new. Got a brand new scapegoat. Exactly. <laughs> 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 but it just draws the attention forward. It's a progressive move, isn't it? And football is a progressive sport where, yeah. where change is, is necessary, momentum is necessary. So it just moves things forward. It doesn't feel like we're in stasis, which I think that feeling had set in just a little bit uh, in, yeah, the, in the opening weeks of the season. Yeah, possibly. I think, bear in mind as well, that it's not been an... Like, the fish list not made it an easy start. Man United, Everton, Liverpool coming up and, and Burnley away. I think if you... If you get on top at Burnley, it's a it's a very winnable game. But if they make it into their game, um, I mean that whole thing about Styles making fights, it was very much their fight, <laughs> at Tough Moor rather than rather than Leeds. So it's not as if you're on an, an easy run of fixtures. But the one thing about Leeds in, in the Premier League and actually in the Championship as well was that they very rarely went through long periods where form abandoned them. So there should be a lot of confidence there. I think in relation to second season syndrome, do you agree that? we want to kind of prove to ourselves that we are Premier League this season and that last season wasn't just a blip. So that assuming we're, we're relatively comfortable this season and we replicate roughly there or thereabouts what happened last season, that next summer nerves should dissipate a little bit. Don't know. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I kind of feel like we'll probably go through this sort of summer every year regardless of what's going on because you can never be sure about what's coming next and no matter how high you claim there's always somewhere else to go isn't there so if you hit the Europa League then what's the obvious thing to go for after that if you find yourself one day in the Champions League what's the obvious thing to go for after that even if like City or other clubs you're winning these things are going close to to winning these things Um, I don't imagine Guardiola goes many days without thinking about the fact that he's never won the Champions League over there and if you win it once, you want to win it twice. I'm sure it was Alex Ferguson who said that, you know, that like that sensation of winning things is there and then it's gone. And suddenly. He also said similar, yeah, wasn't he? And bit of suddenly, despair afterwards. I mean, he, he felt like that over the promotion weekend. It was, it, it obviously really, really got to him, you know, really, really took him. But then by the following week, um, once the title party had gone, um, you know, that was it, moving onwards. And um, he would he would still feel, talk about it now in, in affectionate terms. I don't imagine he thinks about it much. I bet you're fun at parties anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just with reference to the League Cup, it'd be nice to have a cup run, wouldn't it? Fulham away in the next round. That's winnable. Yeah. I felt that last season with the, the FA Cup, particularly because by that stage in January, you knew it was going to take quite a spectacular collapse for Leeds to finish bottom three. You felt like they were they were very close to already being safe. Ah, you fool. And, well, yes, I know. I know. Um, I didn't dare say that because of what would have inevitably happened, but... That was why Crawley, to me, felt like a, a real, real waste of a very winnable tie that could have kind of got you going. Um, Crew was, I, I know the goals came late, but it was kind of always always under control, I thought, that one. Um, Fulham, winnable. Yeah, let's have it. I think in the same way that us getting promoted very much got a, a monkey off our back, I think getting to Wembley and actually winning something might be nice in that regard, and we shed that idea of failure that you know when Victor Orta came in when you were off and he was saying that Leeds has kind of got failure baked into its DNA everybody doubts that you know we get to Wembley we lose that's what we do we need to kind of move past that see I'm thinking we get to Fulham and lose <laughs> <laughs> which would be the better outcome probably wouldn't it probably. <laughs> well if, if you're going to get done at some point get it over with early yeah gentlemen thank you very much we will uh, reconvene in a week's time and get subscribed to The Athletic if you're not on there just yet you can get 33% off at theathletic.com forward slash leads pods and we'll speak to you in a bit.